The White Sox almost find themselves at the All-Star break here in the 2023 campaign, and as you can see, they have recently been absolutely boat raced by this Toronto Blue Jays club. Just an absolute shellacking, but also in that series, Sean Burke had himself a game, a 2-1 win, highlighted by Burke going seven and two-thirds, only giving up one hit, one earned run, and striking out 10 batters. Where did that come from? Who knows? Burke has actually been quite surprising this season for us. He's been a serviceable starter here in our rotation. The Sox play and host to the St. Louis Cardinals here for some interleague play at guaranteed rate field. The Sox obviously not good this year. The Cardinals, they are much better in this than they are in real life. Actually above 500 team playing how they probably should be. Miles Michaelis making the start for the Cardinals. Take a look at the White Sox lineup on the day listed 129, as well as the starter on the day, Mike Clevenger, the right-hander throwing his 18th game for the Sox. And there you have the Cardinals lineup 1-9. to nine. We'll start things off with Clevenger facing Brendan Donovan. He spits on ball four and he'll take his base there. So he's on first base with one out, brings up Goldschmidt. He's got a poke one into right field. So first and second here for the Cardinals, as then that's going to bring up Nolan Gorman, who's going to take a 1-1 pitch, and he proceeds to go up the middle into center field. That's going to score Donovan and the Cardinals strike first as Gorman's solid season continues here for St. Louis. But then Lars Newtbar would pop one up into left field as Benintendi is going to put that one away in foul territory. Move things on to bottom two now. Oscar Mercado absolutely squishes this one. I mean, look where that ends up. Who knew he had that kind of power? Mercado goes 474 into the left field seats. Clevenger is like, that's my bad. No shit. So bottom four now. It's a 2 nothing game. Tim Anderson going out the left field. He continues to hit here before the trade deadline as he finds himself in scoring position on second base. Luis Robert rocking high socks. Chops one out to second base. Moves the runner up now with two down over on third. And Aloy Jimenez gets inside added into right field. That's going to bloop in and it's going to score a run. So it's now a two to one ball game. It's now bottom five. Andrew Vaughn, how do you do? Left field, this one into the seats. A solo shot ties the game here in the fifth. Andrew Vaughn connects on that one and then brings up Jake Berger. He would proceed to go perfect, perfect into right center field. That's going to roll slow up against the wall. And he has himself a double. So he's in scoring position here. That brings up Grandal. And my goodness, the man who hasn't done anything all season, the man who's days away essentially from being DFA'd, two-run blast gives the White Sox a lead. They're their first of the game. It's now a 4-2 game. So top, bottom five still, Elvis Andrews then hits a line drive over the head of the leaping Arenado at third. It's a single, though, as he's held up. And then Anderson also rips one in the left field, back-to-back -back hard hit singles for this Sox club. But then the Cardinals would take Michaelis out of the game and bring on Steven Matz, the lefty, out of the bullpen. He's facing Luis Robert Jr., who hits a line drive, and up he goes. Gorman robs him for the second out of the inning. And then Aloy Jimenez, hard hit right at the left fielder of Mercado. Nothing else going for the Sox, but they do have a 4-2 lead. So top six here, Nolan Arenado pokes one into right field. He gets on for the leadoff hit. Then it brings up Gorman. Cutter runs inside. I guess it somehow hit him. It must have hit his hand before it hit the bat. Although, it isn't the rule like he, your hand is... I don't know. I don't know what the rule is. He gets hit by pitch. He's on first base. So first and second now after the strikeout. Back-to-back -back Ks. First, it's Newt Bar, Then it's Carlson. Two down. And then it brings up Mercado. And then nice little just reach behind the back. Oh, look what I've got here as Clevenger makes the play. Gets out of the jam there. Move things on to the top of the eighth where Kendall Graveman comes on with a two-run lead. And Paul Goldschmidt gets himself another hit here in this game. This time he's going to go out up against the wall. That's going to be a leadoff double for the first baseman of this Cardinals team. And then Nolan Arenado just hits a high fly ball to left field. This one just keeps carrying and carrying and carrying into the bullpen. A two-run blast. And the Cardinals have tied this one back up on Arenado's 17th home run of the season. Move things on to bot eight now. Steven Matt's still on the hill. Clint Frazier grounding one up the middle. 
And that's a leadoff single. Then it brings up Vaughn, cannot lay off the low sinker. That is a 5-4-3 double play, two down in the inning just like that. But then it brings up Jake Berger, Whopper, whopper, there's Big Bopper. A solo shot. The man unable to hit with runners on scoring position. Simply, thousand IQ play from the White Sox there. Make sure nobody's on. They've got the lead. So now we move things on to the top of the ninth. Liam Hendricks coming on looking for the save. Six for six in opportunities so far since returning from the IL. And he would get things started off nicely. Strikes at the catcher, Jacob Nottingham. And then also gets Tommy Edmond locked up. Two down, quickly brings up Brennan Donovan. Ground ball, perfectly played by Berger. Throw in the dirt, Vaughn can't handle it. They give the error on the throw to Berger, but it was pretty equally to blame. And then, suddenly, two base runners on. Two outs, first and second, brings up Arenado. Ball four, spits on that. Bases are just suddenly drunk here for the Cardinals. Nolan Gorman comes up. Hits a line drive to right field. This one just keeps going. Ricochets off the top of the wall and out of here. And suddenly it's an 8-5 to five game. The Cardinals just completely broke the back of the White Sox with that one. The at-bats just did not go well for the White Sox in the bottom half of the inning. They were completely defeated. 8-5 ends up being your final. All of that happened after the error on the burger throw and then the Vaughn scoop that he couldn't get. I mean, just... It just burger giveth, burger taketh. But Nolan Arnato picks up player of the game honors. He goes two for four in the day with a home run. Nolan Gorman gets the game-winning grand slam on Hendricks' first blown save of the season. Berger goes three for four. He had the go-ahead home run on the eighth, and then obviously the throwing error. And then Tim Anderson had a four-hit day. He continues to be hot around the deadline. And we have officially reached one of the most interesting parts of the schedule for us. It is the 2023 MLB First Year Player Draft here. Our Chicago White Sox are going to be picking 15th overall this season. And the first three picks in the draft ended up being Edgar Lorenz, a shortstop, went to the, the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Washington Nationals selected a starting pitcher in Brady or Barry Gutierrez. And then the Detroit Tigers took a closer in Satchel Dell. So move things on to our pick, 15th overall in the first round. Pretty clear-cut best available for us at this point. We ended up going with Jesus Gutierrez, a left-handed pitcher, a starter out of the Dominican Republic. We ended up signing him for $3.7 million. And in the second round, a bit more decision went into this one. Choosing between Adam Choi, a right-handed starter out of Taiwan, or Milt Robinson, an outfielder out of Missouri. 50th overall pick. Robinson ranked 50th by both us and our scouts, and MLB. Choi was unranked by MLB, so I just kind of guessed that the other teams wouldn't be as in on him. So I opted to take Robinson, thinking that maybe Choi would be available next round or even later in the draft. And we ended up signing Robinson for $1.81 million. And unfortunately, I totally underestimated the CPU. Choi was not available in the third round, but we did have ourselves some decent options here. This one came down to three different players. A right-handed starter in David Nunez, hard thrower, high, high strikeout guy it seems. Uh, another right-handed starter in James Silva, more well-rounded type pitcher but really high potential, but we aren't 100% sure on him. He's only 85% scouted. Then there was a shortstop, Eli Castillo, high potential, good glove man. Maybe you can develop a bat somewhere down the line. I ended up going with Castillo because I liked the potential and the glove, and we just don't have any glove in our system essentially right now. And I wanted to get a shortstop into our system as well because I just feel like we have a severe lack of middle infield talent in our organization. So Castillo ended up signing for $769,000. And then in the fourth round, turns out David Nunez was still there, so we took him. He was still available, we signed him for $517,000. And then in the fifth round, James Silva was still there. We took him with that pick. Signed him for three hundred and sixty-eight thousand, and then unfortunately in the sixth round at this point, we had like maybe three guys scattered, and all of them were just so bad they weren't even good enough to be minor league filler. So we ended up taking a guy who we had not scouted, Chris Perkins, an outfielder. I opted not to sign him though because after a couple of the signing periods and spent scouting on him as the number one priority, turns out he was not actually good. So Chris Perkins not going to be signed by the White Sox. 
So I used to do these all-star break episodes as standalone episodes in the past, and I'll be honest, those stat-only update episodes are awful. They're, they're just an absolute pain to edit. They're an absolute bore to watch. It ends up me just being, just listing off just every stat imaginable. Me just going, oh, this team's leading this division, this team's leading that division. And I mean, you could just guess going into everyone. It's like, oh, the Yankees are leading the AL East. Who could have seen it coming? Oh, the Dodgers are leading the NL, NL West. Who could have seen it coming? So we're going to be changing it up now with this new format where the draft goes on at the same time as the break. Where we're going to be showing the draft and then just the relevant things, the things that I find interesting that maybe people would want to see and stuff that's relevant to our team, obviously, at the break. And it's going to be included in an episode with probably only two games because... Uh, you know, there's a lot of updates to get through with the draft and also the break combined, but maybe there'll be three games in some of these episodes, most likely just two in the All-Star break ones. And I just feel like this is a better way to do it rather than just having me just list off all the stats like that and be like, ah, oh, surprise, Ronald Vicuña made the All-Star team, can you believe it? Turns out Mike Trapp, he's got good numbers, what a shocker. So with that being said, let's just jump straight into the update here. As you can see, our Chicago White Sox are currently sitting third in the American League Central with a 39-53 and record. Pretty bad teams in this division with us and the Tigers and the Royals. I would say the only surprise team around the league is the Atlanta Braves, who are actually below 500. Pretty much everyone else is right around where you would expect them to or where they are in real life, essentially. Aside from the Cardinals, who we just played, who are above 500. As far as some of the stats, though, Bo Bichette is actually hitting 381, which is leading the American League. Jacob deGrom is the pitching war leader. Zach Eflin and Brady Singer are having good seasons as well with the pitchers. Trout is leading in batter war. Stephen Kwan has the third highest war among batters. In the National League, Trace Thompson is tied for second in home runs in the National League with 26. He's also top three in war. Brendan Rodgers is also playing well for the Colorado Rockies. Jamison Tyone is the war leader for the pitchers. And now on to a big reason for why I do not care about the All-Star team in this game at all. Our All-Star representative is Yon Moncada, the man with like a 620 OPS. It might even be lower. Not a good season. Not good at all. Not playing good defense. Maybe he is, I don't know. It's probably average defense at best. Not hitting. No reason why he should be an all-star. Especially when Aloy Jimenez is on our roster, hitting with like a 900 OPS. who has been our best player by far the whole season long. And the game just makes it Yon Moncada. And somehow that's not even the most ridiculous one. The most ridiculous one is that Javi Baez is an all-star in the American League for the Detroit Tigers, despite slashing 204, 256, and 303. No need to worry, though. No need to worry. This is about year 12 straight of stuff like this happening in franchise all the time. But don't worry, every single player that was in the Futures game, they all have a 99 overall Diamond Dynasty card that was put into the game like about three seconds after the Futures game ended. And just in case that wasn't enough, we gotta spend the rest of our money on not fixing franchise, but instead we have to play the Kaiju ad for the Diamond Dynasty event into July on MLB TV. Still getting that ad all the time. We also have our first trade update of the season here as Mark Leiter Jr., you can see, is wearing a Diamondbacks uniform as he made the All-Star team for the Cubs, but wearing a Diamondbacks uniform because he was traded right at the break. Manuel Pena, a second baseman, is the one going back to the Cubs in that deal. And now moving on to the stats of our White Sox players. Aloy Jimenez continues to be the best bat in our team despite not making the All-Star team an 890 OPS with a 19 home run stat line on the season. Tim Anderson continues to be on fire heading into the deadline. We'd love to see it boost that value. Unfortunately, Luis Robert Jr. has still not been good. He's been struggling this season. Only a 275 OBP and a 381 slugging. Definitely not what you want to see from like the cornerstone of your team, essentially. Big Whopper, Jake Berger. 13 home runs, but overall has not been good. Just straight up bad defensively. 254 OBP. He's the old tr he's the old one true outcome player. And then we know Grandal has been bad as well. His days are numbered. Uh, Elvis Andres is interesting because he's an expiring contract, currently swinging a hot bat. Wouldn't really net a huge return, but could get something for him, and that's definitely better than nothing. And then on the pitching side of things, unfortunately, Dylan Cease has still been quite meh for us. ERA and FIP in the low fives. 
while Sean Burke has actually been serviceable. ERA under four, but the FIP definitely not great at 449. It's not awful, but it's not good either. I just think it's funny that he's getting quite lucky with a solid ERA and not a good FIP uh, with this defense behind him. And what you are currently looking at is a preview of what our trade block looks like. Every single player you see listed here could be gone post-trade deadline. No longer members of the Chicago White Sox. I'm not 100% sure about a couple of them. Uh, a couple of the guys who were on deals where they have next year as well. I'm not 100% sure about trading them. Like maybe not Lance Lynn. Maybe not Hendricks yet. Maybe not Graveman. We'll have to see. But it's very conceivable that every single one of these guys could be gone. And honestly, if guys like Berger or Sheets were having good years, I would look into trading them as well. Because I just don't think like 26-year-old Gavin Sheets or especially Jake Berger are members of the next good White Sox team. But we're not going to just trade guys with a ton of years of control uh, for no value while they're hitting like 620 OPSs. That's just not, that's not smart baseball team building. One trade we are not going to wait on doing, though, is Elvis Andrus. We are going to take advantage of him swinging that hot bat right now. We are going to send him to the Miami Marlins, who are currently three and a half games out of a wildcard spot. Luis Arise has a broken collarbone, so they could use a steady middle infielder on their roster. And coming our way from the Miami Marlins is going to be Evan Fitter, a right-handed starter. He's going to go pitch for AA Birmingham for us. And then since we replaced, simply since we got rid of Ellis Andrews, we need somebody to come up and replace him at the big league team. That is going to be Eric Gonzalez, getting the call up from AAA Charlotte to replace him. He's had some time with Miami and Pittsburgh and Cleveland in the big leagues in the past, playing well in AAA for us, 794 OPS, solid defender. He's going to come up and play some middle infield for the big league team. Also, we're not going to wait on the Grandal DFA. I've been hinting at it. He's gone. He's getting DFA'd. There's no point in having him on the team the rest of the year. He's been awful. We can't trade him. We don't need him to play. You know, it's it's not like if we call up a catcher from AAA, he's all of a sudden going to have our team win 20 games and ruin our draft stock. Especially since we're not even calling up the ideal option because Carlos Perez would probably be the guy we do actually want to call up here to replace Grandal, but we're actually going to be calling up Xavier Fernandez, our other AAA catcher, at least until Perez is back from his injury, his fractured hand. And then we're also going to use the waiver wire a bit here. Not something I usually take advantage of in this game because it's just really tedious to use. Because it's not, like, it's not like OTP. Anybody who's ever seen me play OTP knows that I love to claim guys off waivers even when I don't need guys off waivers. I could have 15 left field first base type guys who can hit but have no real position. And the second I see one pop up in waivers, I'm like, hmm, this guy's interesting. But I don't even really have the opportunity to do that just on, based on how this game works. And also just how the menus are set up. Like, I have to go into the calendar advance a day, then go over to the roster screen or the, the transaction screen, go to the pending, look in there, see what's if there's anybody on there. Then I have to back out of that, go back into the calendar, sim a day. And it's, I'm not, it's pointless. Why would I do that? But on the off chance that I do take a look at the pending free agents or the pending waiver wires rather, and I see somebody I like on there, somebody I think is interesting, we might as well slap a claim on them. And the player we are going to be slapping a claim on is Il Ilamaro Vargas, a utility man. He's been with Washington this season. Solid contact versus right-handed pitching, really high vision, good glove, can play all over the field. Second, third, short, can also play the, both the corners and the outfield. The plan is basically for him and Eric Gonzalez to platoon at shortstop once Tim Anderson is traded at the deadline. But for now, he's going to be a bench piece on the big league roster for us as Zach Remillard is going to go down to AAA. And then why not make some more roster moves? Why not make this roster even more different than it was pre-All-Star break? And then it's even going to be even more different post-trade deadline. But we're going to be DFAing Guillermo Heredia. He's also been bad. I mean, I love his defense. He's, he's old, though. We know what he is. He's not hitting for us. I thought maybe he'd be interesting to have just because we didn't really have anybody. And I also kind of played into the whole Cuban thing because the White Sox have a bunch of Cuban guys. But uh, Heredia, not really. There's no there's no reason to keep him around. So we're DFAing him. He's gone. Thank you for your time here. But I want to see what we have in Victor Reyes, who's been in AAA for us this season. He's been solid down there in AAA. 
I like his ratings. He's a C potential, which isn't that bad. Uh, we have a lot of D potential guys in the system. So C potential, that's, that's good to me. Switch hitter, really solid contact. Decent drag bunt guy too. Good vision, decent defense. Has some speed to his game too. I like what I see from him, so I want to see if maybe he can come up to the big leagues, and who knows, maybe he's like a scrappy, fun player to have on some of our more middling, bad teams here at the big league club. These Sox are at home here, playing host to their crosstown rivals, the Chicago Cubs. Some interleague rivalry action here at Guaranteed Right Field. The 43 and 57 Cubs and the 44 and 57 Chicago White Sox. So Sean Burke is making the start for the Sox on the day, making his 13th start of the season, and he'll be opposed by Marcus Stroman making his 21st start of the season. We're going to start things off bottom half of the first inning, runner on first base. One out, Luis Robert, chopper over to shortstop. Morell tosses the second. They turn it into a 6 4 3 double play. So nothing going for the Sox. Move things on top two, Christopher Morell with a long shot into center field, but Robert tracks that one down. And then with two outs, it would bring up Rios, who pops one at the left field, Benintendi puts it away. Move on top three, Jan Gomes, chopper over to Anderson at second base, showing off the versatility here for some potential buyers to the trade deadline by playing a second position. As then it's another ground out by Mervis, and then Hap also. Swing and bunt there, chopper back to Burke, makes the play himself, one, two, three inning. Top four here, one down. Look at this, Andrew Vaughn, or I should say two down, top four, as Andrew Vaughn makes a fantastic play there somehow. But then top five, the defense falls apart as Luis Robert makes a terrible jump, and that's gonna lead to a double there with one out by Edwin Rios. Then it brings up Gomes, who's gonna bloop one in front of Robert in center field. That's gonna move up the runner to third base, so runners are on the corners here with one out. For the Cubbies, brings up Matt Mervis, who's going to pop this one up into shallow left field. Nobody can get to it, falls in. Rios is gonna try to score, but Ben Benintendi says, no, 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 sir. Still a scoreless game, runners on the corners, two outs. And unfortunately, they do get a ball past Vaughn there. And a run is going to come in. So the Cubs take a 1-0 lead here in this ball game. Runners on second and third now. As then Suzuki hits one into center field. And that's going to score two for the Cubs. And now it's a 3-0 lead for the Cubbies. Move things on top five. Moncada says we need to get ourselves on the board. He's going dead center field. That one's out of here over the leaping glove of Bellinger. And it's a solo shot off the bat of Yon Moncada, makes it a 3-2-1 ball game. Well, I move things on, bottom seven. Hard hit ground ball from Robert, but it is going to be an out nonetheless. And then Vaughn, also another hard ground ball, but this time to the third baseman. Pulls him off the bag. He does reach, but nothing else goes on in the inning, so we move things on to the eighth, where Adbert Alzale comes on for the Cubbies for the 36th time this season. And he's facing Xavier Fernandez catching on the day. And he's going to get himself a little hit here. Off the wall in left center field. A leadoff double for the catcher. Recently up from AAA Charlotte. And then Ben Benintendi chops one over to third base. The diving play off the glove. So first and second after the infield single. Anderson then unfortunately pops up to the infield. So two down now. Brings up Luis Robert. He's just going to fly one to right field. It's going to be put away and nothing going for the White Sox. So on to the top of the ninth now, Joe Kelly is going to come out of the bullpen here for the Sox. And it's a, still a two-run game until Edwin Rios comes up with two outs and he goes out to left center field and makes it a three-run game. That would pretty much put this game out of reach as Rios hits his 16th home run of the season. Cody Hoyer comes on for the Cubs for the second time this season, looking for his second save, and he would proceed to get that as he works a 1-2-3 inning, topped off by a fly up by Moncada, as the Cubbies do win this game here in the Crosstown rivalry. 4-2-1 is the final. Marcus Stroman picks up player of the game honors as the Sox bats just could not get anything going against his ground ball workings on the day. Only four hits given up, four strikeouts, no walks, and one earned run. Sean Burke, on the other hand, did give up eight hits through five innings, but only three runs. 
one uh, no walks and two Ks. But like I said, the offense just did nothing behind him as really the only thing to show for on the day was six total hits and Moncada had a home run, a solo shot, and Fernandez had a double and then did not get driven in. So with that being said, that's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the Chicago White Sox franchise here on MLB The Show 23. I've been your host, Jersey Bourne, and I'm saying onions, 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 onions. Thank you.